So last lecture we started the convection diffusion equation. Anybody still remember what that equation looks like? Okay, we have two differential, I mean we have three differential terms, right? Three terms that involve derivatives. One term is the derivative with respect to time, right? The second term we call, uh, this is basically the unsteady term, the, the, uh, the increase or decrease of the solution with respect to time. The second term we call the advection term. So a big U times partial U partial X. Okay, so that term, uh, what does it do? What does the big U control? How does the multiplier on this term control in the advection diffusion equation? Anybody still remember? Does things move towards the right or towards the left, right? So a uh, positive U moves the solution towards the right. A negative U moves the solution towards the left. And the third derivative term is similar to the second, except for it has a second order derivative. And anybody remember what that term controls? Huh? how fast it's moving, but how fast it's moving is controlled by the second term. Uh, the larger the magnitude of U is, the faster the solution moves, either towards the left or towards the right, depending on the sign of the solution, right? The third term, the diffusion term, controls how fast the solution gets smoothed out, right? Remember in the last lecture, uh, a large kappa makes the solution becomes a flat line really quickly, right? Okay, a small kappa takes a long time for the solution to die out. And then we have an algebraic term. F can depend on U, but not on the derivatives of U. Or it can just be a constant. So that's what we call a source term. So this is the, this is advection or convection term. This is the diffusion term. And this is the source term. Okay, so going back to MATLAB. Uh, so for example, so this function lets us set uh, u and the kappa. So for example, if I only let the advection term work, if I have no kappa, which means kappa equal to zero, one and zero, what do I have? If I draw a solution like that, okay, the solution just keeps moving towards the right. There is no diffusion happening. There is no flattening of the solution. Okay, stop this. On the other hand, if I set the advection velocity u, set, uh, previously we set kappa to 0, u to 1. If we set u to 0 and kappa to something, let's say 0 0.01, just to make things visible and slow. Let's see. What we get, let's try to draw the same. Okay. What we get is there is no bulk movement but the solution keeps getting diffused out. It becomes smooth, and then smoother, and smoother. If we wait for a long enough time, what do you think it'll become? It'll become a flat line, right? Okay, so that's the behavior of this equation as we see computationally from the computer. And today let's have analysis showing why they behave like that. Can we look at the equation? Can we stare at the equation and tell they are supposed to behave like that? Those who think we can just stare at the equation and uh, tell they will behave like that, please raise your hand. Oh, one, oh, two, three, okay, very small percentage, four, okay, good, good. So, so this equation, we can actually do that. Okay, we can actually stare the equation and uh, have a qualitative, at least, answer of how the solution is supposed to behave. And that is very important. So I, I got a survey of, uh, from the industry leaders, like the company, big uh, uh, companies that like, uh, are leaders in technology. They, they tell like, what, 
what are the new hires missing in their training? And uh, particularly, the, the survey I looked at was uh, uh, what was like the, the hires that are hired to do computational work, to do computational simulations and uh, uh, work on numerical methods for, for, for their engineering and the scientific uh, uh, career. So the top missing element is actually the ability to look at a numerical solution and assess if it's real, right? Assess if it makes sense. Is it completely garbage or it actually is a valid solution? Of course, you can never tell that 100%, but there are many pretty obvious cases you should be able to tell. So today, let's uh, look at a uh, first uh, example of how can you tell if a numerical solution is supposed to behave as, as it does. So for example, we'll be looking for several limiting cases. Okay, so we'll be looking at the behavior of three limiting cases. So the first limiting, limiting case is when u is equal to zero. That's exactly what we have seen. And uh, let's also set f equal to zero. So this case, we get partial u, partial t is equal to kappa times partial square u, partial x squared. All right. OK. So this equation is, has a pretty uh, simple name. It's called the heat equation. So it's called the heat equation because it's most uh, often being associated with the diffusion of heat in a non-moving thing like a solid, right? So if you have a solid, the rate of change of temperature is equal to the conduction coefficient times the second derivative of the temperature distribution. So that's what the uh, that's usually called the heat equation. And we will look at its uh, uh, characteristics from the next slide. But here, let's just uh, uh, say that this is a prototypical example of what's called a parabolic equation. The reason why it is called a parabolic equation almost doesn't matter here. Uh, in order to explain that, you have to do some math that is uh, really not covered in this, uh, this class. So if you study theoretical PDs in the math department, you, they, they'll tell you a very good uh, explanation of why this is called a parabolic equation. And the other equations are called elliptic or hyperbolic. right? But here, let's just uh, uh, Remember, it's called a parabolic equation. And we'll analyze in the, next, uh, uh, in the next page what behavior is expected from a parabolic equation. The second special case we're going to be looking at is when it's actually uh, when both u is equal to 0 and du dt is equal to 0. So what you get is only the whole left-hand side is 0. So basically, 0 is equal to kappa times du squared dx squared. But f in this case may not be 0. <coughs> so this also has a, uh, has a name called Poisson's equation, because it is uh, associated with the mathematician, French mathematician Poisson. So this equation. In this special case, it's actually an ODE. I shouldn't even write partial square u, partial x square, because there is only one, uh, u only depends on one dimension, right? But uh, uh, I'm still going to be writing partial here, because this is a numerical PD class. But like a better reason is that the Poisson's equation effectively carries over to multiple dimensions. For example, if, I, if u depends not only on x, but also on y, I can add a, another kappa times d squared u dy squared, and the equation will behave qualitatively the same. It is an example of what's called an elliptic equation. And uh, we'll analyze a little bit 
what behavior expect is expected from an elliptic equation uh, pretty soon. So the third example is instead of having u equal to 0, we set kappa equal to 0, and uh, f is equal to 0. In this case, we get still a non-zero time derivative term. And the u term is no longer 0. This is actually the first uh, example we demonstrated in the beginning of the lecture. It is equal to 0. What's the behavior of this equation? The solution almost remains a constant, but shifts either towards the right or towards the left. Right? Okay. This is called uh, the linear advection equation. It is the simplest form of the third type of equation we are going to be talking about is hyperbolic equation. And again, there is a mathematical theory behind why it's called a parabolic, elliptic, and uh, hyperbolic, but we are not going to go into that theory uh, here. OK, but we will analyze what a parabolic, elliptic, and uh, hyperbolic equation is supposed to behave. And to give you an intuition, when you see different terms in a partial differential equation, you should have an intuitive understanding of how the equation is going to have a solution that looks like.